Brittany Hoffman, what's happening? How are you? So happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, beautiful uh, Miami uh, summer day here. I'm assuming it's the same for you out in Surf City, USA. It is. It's been kind of humid here. And if it's even kind of humid here, people make a huge stink about it. But I know you guys live in that, so. And you know, I missed it. I was out, I lived in Orange County for 10 years. Um, and uh, I missed the subtropical, um, you know, that, that, I don't know what it was. Every time I would come back and visit, uh, I'd step off the airplane and it was that balmy, sweaty, like, yeah, I like it. I like it. And then out there, it's like, pass the moisturizer because it's just crazy dry. I mean, the one thing you guys have out there that I do like is because of the humidity, it stays warm at night. Where I know people like that it gets cool here, but I like being able to just walk outside and not have to wear a jacket at night. Yeah, I, well, I, I'm mixed, mixed in feelings about that because I did always like, I always said it's a hoodie in the morning and board shorts by noon. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, well, I brought, the, I brought that style you know, back to Miami and it's, it's, it's no- It's not way. working for you, huh? No, not even a little bit down here. So. Um, I've, I've resorted to, if I'm not on stage uh, or doing something camera worthy, I don't have the bow tie on, but um, I do rock the podcast suck if you don't have one shirt. Um, I've actually never seen you without a bow tie. Hey, <laughs> so that's, this is my alternate uniform. I, I constantly get asked, I was thinking about maybe putting a bow tie on the t-shirt, but that's a little, you know, 80s, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, what are the uh, movies in the 80s called? Um, like, I know what uh, you're talking about. Like, uh, like uh, you know, uh, Pretty in Pink. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, I, I always picture like one of those guys in the 80s movies with like, the tuxedo t-shirt on. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thanks for taking time out of your day to hang out with me for a few minutes here. Uh, we're recording video too, so you could be watching this on YouTube. You could be watching this on Facebook or maybe even LinkedIn, seeing a teaser of this or listening and tuning into the show. I sure do appreciate you tuning in from wherever you're viewing it here. Um, Brittany and I connected, funny story, probably about, uh, what year did Ask Gary V come out? Uh, I mean, when I was working on, when, after Gary moved me to New York was 2015. Okay. So it might have been 20. I don't know if you saw me on an episode in 2015 and 2016. Yeah, I think it might have been 2015 because the book, no, actually the book was not out yet. It was one of no, those. No, the, the, book, the book came out that I know very well because I worked really hard on that. That was March 2016. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. So, so that's exactly right around that time frame is when uh, you and I connected via email, just like in 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 being cc'd on it. Like Gary had forwarded you an email and said, "Hey, make sure my boy down in Miami gets a book." And um, we were hunting that book down for like a, a couple of weeks. So by default, you and I had started a conversation back and forth. Finally, got the damn book. Actually, I got. Yeah, I got that. And then he had asked me to buy like I don't know four copies. They've been great gifts ever since then. I'm like I need a door prize. I'm like I got you. <laughs> yeah, but, to give uh, people context on that, just so just so people know, this was I mean, influencer marketing is now such such a buzz term, but sure. this was kind of I don't want to say early on in the influencer game when it came to Instagram, and I had to find 750 influencers to hold his book for free, and I had to I was DMing these people from my account just like hand to hand combat to find these people, and. Uh, and then I was sending these crazy CSVs to HarperCollins, and then those weren't going out. So basically, I ended up, and I'm not kidding, this is one of those things that I'll tell my kids. I was walking books in the snow to the post office with like hand, you know, hand put on my stamp, and I put them in the envelope, and I stuffed it, and I walked them with my like wheelbarrow pretty much down to the, uh, you know, in Manhattan to get delivered. So, so that book had my blood, sweat, and tears on it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, I had remembered... I think I looked you up on Instagram um, through the email thread that we had had, and then I had started to follow you. And then shortly thereafter, like a few months later, was I don't even know how the I mean, anyway we met it. We finally met in person. Hashtag IRL um, <laughs> in in San Diego, uh, but a gig I had for uh, digital marketers traffic and conversions, and you were out there, and I like came randomly walking up to like one of the hotel bars, and it was really quiet like during the day, and I was like. Is your name Brittany? And you're like, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I'm a friend of Gary. I'm a friend of Gary. Hands up. No. Um, well, actually, and your boyfriend looks like Gary. So I thought, oh my God, that's Gary and Brittany right there. I'm totally going for it. So, well, it's funny. Uh, so I don't seem like I'm completely off guard because I need to give context for this. We had gotten there early. I, I drove down to San Diego for um, because I was there with a client. And 
we were kind of off like like the traffic and conversion stuff was in more the main area and we were pretty much we just gotten there we're tired we're sitting by ourselves i had my back to you i had my back to like where people would enter so you like came around like this potted plant area you like popped out and surprised me and asked if, <laughs> if i was Brittany, and it was just like oh my god like all of it was not expected <laughs> who is this but i thought well how random is that i'm like that has to be her i've been following on instagram for a little while so um and then uh that was fun we further connected i ended up having a few drinks on the rooftop with the crew you were there with and met bonin and um, he was running around with a camera guy too. So, um, mm -hmm. it was great to connect and then stay in touch here. So let's back up a little bit. So you're, um, you, you got out of school and what happened? So yeah, to back everyone up, yeah, we're I gonna go, am... we're going to go, we're going way back because I get, we could sit here and talk about, I'll go on and on like, look squirrel. So I'm like structure, Sebastian, we're going to talk about a structured story here. Yeah. So as far as online, if you're looking for me, I'm probably under Brittany Crystal, which is spelled K-R-Y-S-T-L-E. So that's my middle name. And is there I just a backstory kind of, on that? Yeah, a little. Oh, Crystal? The backstory on that was actually, it ended up being super smart. It was really because on Gmail, I got Brittany Crystal and Brittany Hoffman was taken and I didn't want to put a dot in my email address or whatever it was. And then just for handles, it was shorter. And I realized, and this is, you know, this is one of those things, but for a woman, maybe I would get married and maybe I'd decide to change my last name. So I just kind of kept the Brittany Crystal because I knew that wasn't going to go anywhere. And then Crystal is, I found out recently, was a character in Dynasty in the 80s, which I had no idea until like my parents, I asked my parents and they were like, oh yeah, no, it was like the main character's name in the spelling. And I was like, oh cool. <laughs> so that's, that's that. And then as far as my education, grew up in, now people know what Calabasas is because of the Kardashians, but I grew up in LA. I went to UCLA for undergrad. Basically, my choices were like lawyer and doctor for professions, and doctor wasn't yeah, going to happen. Which one, which one would you like, Brittany? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was like, doctor takes way longer. So I was good at reading and writing and whatnot, so that meant law. Um, I was really interested in entertainment at the time. There was no, you know, I loved television, but there was no social media when I was in, you know, high school and middle school yet. So lawyer it was and I thought the safest route or I was told the safest route to monetization was to be an entertainment lawyer if I wanted to work in the entertainment field so even in thinking my high school yearbook people thought I was going to be an entertainment lawyer like this was a thing went to college graduated early went to Georgetown for law school I was having doubts about law school before I went to law school but I went and I did it I knew in law school that was not for me but I also knew nobody could take it away from me if I actually you know, yeah. I graduated and I passed the bar in New York. Um, and basically after I had two summers of work and I was in school during the time the economy tanked. And so the two summers I was working on securities regulations, litigations cases, and that was awful and boring. And it's boring. Like Sebastian's eyes are glazing over with me saying that sentence. That's how it felt <laughs> working in it. And I was like, this cannot, this cannot be my life. Right. And so I passed the bar so nobody could say shit about me not being able to do it. Right. this was a complete choice. Sure. And then I moved back to LA and started kind of going down that entertainment route. And I guess I don't, I don't know if you want me, if you have any questions about that before I go yeah. into yeah. the rest. So, well, I mean, you seem like you figured out pretty quick, which is cool. I mean, I mean, it doesn't, you know, in, in, in your, well, we all have different timelines, but as far as like getting out of school, being in law school and realizing, you know, fuck this while being in, <laughs> while being in law school, you know, is a pretty good eye awakening gift really, right? So you did it anyway, and I love what you said about, um, I did it because no one could take it away from me. And it's always good to, especially I look, in the, I look back on my path of 15 years of entrepreneurship, I never went to college. Had I had an opportunity to do it all over again, I would have went because there were some times in this entrepreneur journey that were just brutal, that being able to fall back on something that I already had under my belt would be awesome. So that's why my daughter's going and it's not negotiable. But um, so, so fast forward, uh, you, you, you realized you didn't want to be um, uh, uh, an attorney no more. You were still out in LA. How did you connect with Gary? So just to, just to give context for people, it's not like I knew, you know, when I was miserable, I was miserable in school and, you know, everyone that you're around, it's kind of really, it is really hard to just say, I'm not going to do what everybody is telling me is the smart <laughs> thing to do. Right. Given that I was such a good student and, and all of these other things, it's really hard to just be like, no, I'm not going to listen to any of you. I'm really unhappy doing this. So that was a really tough time and one of the most difficult periods of my life. And, and I just think that people don't 
you know, it's easy to talk about it now and kind of gloss over it, but it was really tough because I did not know what I was going to do because you still want that safe income. You know, entrepreneurship wasn't as hot as it is now. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to go work for myself immediately. I was still thinking, oh, I've got to go work. I've either got to find an in-house position or I need to go work for a big company. That was still the thought process. Right. So basically I went, moved back to LA. I started working in Hollywood. I worked at a large talent agency, ICM. I worked at a large management company, which is Burlstein Entertainment Partners. I was working, I thought I wanted to represent writers and directors who, who worked in television because I thought that was the, I didn't think I was creative. I thought my best path to, to being in that creative field was to represent the people who were creative, know that those were the people who were hot, like use my eye to find those people and then advocate for them. So I was thinking about how to position myself that way. I ended up working in, at a reality TV production company and then at the Lifetime Network. And basically- I love those movies. Yeah. <laughs> the movies are good. I was working on the TV development side. So basically what was happening is I knew what I liked or like the, the arena of what I liked, but the jobs I was having, they just weren't the perfect, they weren't the right fit. They didn't feel right, but there were things to learn from each of them and I needed each of them in order to get the next thing. Sure. And so when I was at the Lifetime Network is when, is how Gary comes in. Uh, I noticed that they basically, like the Lifetime Network is giant owned corporation owned by A&E and there's a lot of their stockholders and there's a lot of people to answer to. It was extremely corporate. Yep. And I was really interested in what was going on on the social media side. I was interested in the marketing that was happening. I was looking at the Netflix and the Hulus and they're taking these risks and these chances. And we were taking really safe, safe bets. It just wasn't even interesting. And at that point I wasn't even, I used to watch TV like crazy growing up. That was my, you know, my kind of dessert. Like right. when I was studying for the bar, that would be my break. I would watch like a True Blood or just Friday Night Lights. I'd watch TV. And now I wasn't watching TV at all. I was spending my time on the internet. And so again, going back to what is safe, my parents and pretty much everyone else were like, oh, you need to get an MBA. If you want to switch careers, you want to be in marketing and branding, that needs, you should go get an MBA. Because I had a roommate who worked at Nestle and she went to UCLA for her MBA and they only hired MBAs. So I was studying for the GMAT and my boyfriend, the one who you think looks like Gary, <laughs> he does not for the record because I think that's kind of creepy. But <laughs> yeah. From a distance. Actually, from a yeah. distance. So this was in 2014. He sent me a Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk tweet. I had no clue who he was. It, the tweet was just saying that there were openings in the LA office. It was new LA office. There were openings, not like a sexy tweet at all. My boyfriend was just like, listen, look into this guy. I think you'll like him. you don't study for the GMAT. You don't need to go to business school. And I know I told him he was an idiot and that nobody gets a job through our website. And <laughs> I went to Vayner's website. I picked a job. I hoped I could be qualified for it was in project management and I applied and I went through few rounds of interviews and I was part of the first project management team that started in that LA office and that was August 2014. Fast forward to December of 2014 at the Christmas party and Gary was on, it was the first, my first time meeting Gary and he was on my trivia team because it was a British pub trivia Christmas party and, and I like to tell the story because I think it's so Gary. He there were two other guys on my trivia team. He literally ate our leftover chicken wing leftovers the entire night, like completely unapologetically. Like we would all actually, we all ate our wings and he would go around. Now he's got a trainer and he doesn't eat like this, but he would go around and clean like the gristle off of our wings that we had already eaten. And I was totally like, this is, this is like, this is the guy. And <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty mind blowing. It was, it was funny. Cause he, and he was completely unapologetic. He was like, I'm just going to do this all night. And I was like, that's disgusting, but okay. <laughs> and, and you know, we had a good conversation and the next month he came back and he was like, you're overqualified for what you do. What do you really want to be doing? And he thought I should look into to growth, which wasn't even a concept to me. I, I used to play poker and I thought I wanted to invest his money. I was interested in that startup world. Like that was appealing to me. And he was like, look, in, look into growth. And then over the next few months, oh, and he asked me too if I'd consider moving to New York. I'd lived in New York. My life was in LA. It, I said, it, it depends on what I'd be doing. And so we went back and forth for the next few months. Just, you know, he just casually asked me how long I'd consider moving to New York, to New York for. 
And then in the summer of that year, 2015, he just sat, sat me down. He was like, listen, everything new that happens that I do comes out of New York. I'm about to get really serious about my personal brand. I think you know something about influencers. I think you know something about growth. Give me a year. Come out, move out in October. Give me one year. And we'll see where it goes from there. And I treated that like that was my MBA. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it really was. So yeah, there's a whole story after that part, but that was the lead up. Okay, let's just keep, let's keep it going. Yeah. I was like, so, um, popcorn, yeah. popcorn, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Moved out in October. Um, the role, if you want a super defined role, that job is not for you. This, the team now is, I think is very structured, is way more structured, has over 20 people, you know, dedicated to his personal brand. This yeah. was like six of us kind of filling in gaps and holes, but right. it was the best opportunity that will never exist again in his world at this right, point but right, but right. i do tell people because there's so many people now who want to work for gary work with gary i met gary at the ideal time there are plenty of other people who are and i don't want to say they're like gary but who you can develop that experience with and it would be so incredibly valuable you know people get stuck on the shiny object i didn't know i just knew gary had the potential he was who he said he was i knew i could learn a lot and i went in and I just had to be ready to do everything. So I got to, I got to touch everything from the strategy to the influencer marketing, to the paid ads, to having to reach out at the time. Now people are calling Gary to want to interview him. But at the time I was trying to reach out to small town newspapers in literally every state to see if their business section would want to syndicate his content. Like I learned paid ads, like everything, every, everything and anything that goes into into online brand building and personal brand building, I got to touch and learn. I was running to help start Wine Library's affiliate program. Like the experience was invaluable, but I figured out that I loved personal branding and really fell in love with it when I had to do the promotions for the book, when I was reaching out to people. Yeah. And basically I was reaching out to people. I had to find those 750 influencers, like I said, and the responses I was getting back because these people had, I guess, and I didn't even know they had read Crush It. I was like just DMing like, hi, I'm Brittany. I work for Gary V. Gary is a blah, 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 you know? And basically these people were writing back saying, oh my God, of course I will take and promote this book. No problem. Gary changed my life. The reason I do what I do is because, you know, Gary, so blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, reaffirmed in the midst of your work. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was the first time I'd done, I, I was working on something that felt like it was making a difference for someone else. Like it was, it was the very first time. And I'm sure actually, cause we started filming daily V kind of around the time that I might've had this conversation. Cause another thing is I never wasted Gary's time. Like if I met with him, I met with him five minutes every three months. You know, you casually have conversations, but you don't eat up his time. I know how busy he was. And when I had that whatever three month meeting in early 2016, after reaching out for the book, I was like, I know you test everything on yourself. I love the responses I'm getting. It makes me feel so good. If you're, I knew he was going to build this into a product of some kind, which became Vayner Talent, the personal branding arm. I was like, I want in on this. Like, this is, this is what I like. This is what I do. And from, you know, from working for Gary, I got to a point where, and this is what that model was built on. Just, it became a content machine. I could watch First of all, I can give a Gary keynote at this point, but <laughs> I can watch Me a too. Gary piece of content, a long form piece of content. I knew which two clips work. I knew which 10 image quotes. I was writing his articles at a certain point. I knew which article to write. I knew how to write in his voice. I knew how to optimize it on all the platforms. I just, I just internally became a machine knowing how to do that. And so then I needed to make sure I could do it for other people. And then that's so, what led into the Vayner talent. How, how did that correct. transition take place? So that transition took place, we knew over the course of that year that he was doing this. And so he was bringing people in who were possible potential Vayner Talent clients or just friends who needed, you know, higher level people who needed help, you know, maybe had teams, but didn't really know the social landscape as well. And he'd kind of put them in the room with the team and have us go back and forth with them and explain the process and, and try to help them out. And then he built that out. I think we had our first clients for Vayner Talent in like August, like late July, August of 2016. Uh, Bonham was one of those first clients. And so Bonham was my first Vayner Talent client. And so as soon as that was like really happening, I moved 
I was still writing uh, actual articles for Gary's team and like helping part time on that. But sure. then I was starting working full time building other people's brands and incorporating what I learned from Gary's team into this machine. And that was a, you know, that's a startup in itself too. So yeah, I was doing that. And so I was working with Bonin when I ran into you and that was March of 2017. Yeah. I remember asking you about, um, you're like, yeah, we work with micro influencers. I think that's the first time I ever heard that term. I don't think I said micro. They're definitely not micro influencers. No, no, no. But I think yeah. I asked about like a guy like me who may not be a celebrity yet and doesn't have yeah. a ginormous following. What does that work? And I think that's when you said micro influencer. And I thought, so, I'll take it. You know, the basically like, I think the pitch always was that this is for you know the 1% of the 1%, it's a $30,000 a month product. It's not for people who, you know, I think Gary, Gary's whole thing at the beginning was he didn't want, he wanted people who were super serious about it, who are at a certain level to take it to the next level. Right. I think that's the, that's the jump. I think they were going after, I mean, we had, you know, that core group of people. I don't really know who, necessarily their clients are now, but I think he wanted a good range of athletes and musicians and people who weren't just wanting to be him. I think no, you know, he didn't want just to do that for a ton of marketers or a ton of people who wanted to be Gary's. That doesn't, you know, that, that just wasn't the machine he wanted to build. Right. So, um, um, and then when, when, when did you leave Vayner Talent? How long ago was I that? left in, I actually left not long after the end of April, 2017. I knew, Gary knew this too, that I wanted to work for myself. I needed to make sure I could replicate the results. I liked working for Banner Talent, but there, there just was going to be a point, even when I went to start to work for Gary, my goal was at that year, like when I finished my year, I was going to pitch him like a startup idea. I, I wanted, I liked partnering, but I knew I wanted my own thing. And, uh, you know, that I didn't know I was going to fall in love with personal branding. So that whole thing shifted. And I don't think, you know, taking start, we can argue the merits of taking uh, funding and startup money and, and whatnot. But uh, he knew. And before I moved back to LA, because I was working on Tom Bilyeu's brand at the LA office, I moved back to LA the start of 20, yeah, start of 2017, still working on Vayner Talent. And Gary was like, you want to do your own thing, don't you? And I was like, yeah. He was like, cool. Like he was, he was fully supportive of it, but you know, I was also the first person to actually, and I think I still, I mean, I just am. I'm the first person to spend any time on his team and actually leave Vayner. Um, now I think a few people are starting to leave, but other people who you might recognize if you were a fan of the Ask Gary Vee show, um, like in India or Stunwin or people who had been around are still at Vayner. Yeah. Like I was the first one to, to kind of venture off. That yeah, was I was cool. talking. I was talking. I met his um, his uh, his PR girl, um, and she Emily. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. No, Emily's amazing. I love Emily. I totally, we'll totally, talk to her totally now. I don't know why her name did not pop up, but um, she was more than accommodating for Age of Twenty Twenty One for myself and my team there, and we got a chance to chat. And I'm like, so how long have you been with Gary? She's like employee number six. And I yeah, was, no, he whoa. has flavors, and and you know he's the best boss i've ever had if i was had to have a boss like it should be him he uh he really does give a shit about the people who who he employs and i have no negative nothing negative to say about it i just knew that that wasn't the path for me forever why well, that sounds like a i mean to to be able to get in there and get that experience underneath your belt just like you said you had wrote that office and got my masters and then some really cuz it really didn't stop in new york you got the opportunity to to find your way back out to, to, uh, to the homeland on the West coast, um, and finish your days out, you know, um, and then decide, you know, that transition on what you're doing. So something stuck out uh, that you said a couple of minutes ago, and that was, um, you know, I, I, I had fallen in love with personal branding. When did that start to click? I mean, that started to click when I was, when I was working with Gary and I was doing the influencer thing and they were writing back to me that it was changing changing their lives. Okay. I think when I saw the responses to content that was coming out, because during that time was when all those viral pieces would come out, whether it was about uh, when he was on the breakfast club or whether he was doing a rant about, you know, college and how you should just, you know, like don't give a shit about what you're doing in your twenties, try everything. Right. The feedback he was getting, I felt like his message was important and it was really important to me. And this is something I've learned over the last, you know, 
year and a half of doing my own thing, it's really important to me to help people. I connect with people. Like I connect with people more than brands. That's just the way it is. Right. To really connect to those people and help people grow their brands in order to build their business or their higher purpose. Like I know that sounds a little woo woo and I'm really not woo woo, but that's the case. Um, I noticed one thing I wanted to be doing outside of, you know, with Vayner Talent, you get to work on whoever they tell you to work on. Like that's not, and this is, you know, this is what happens when you work for someone. Like you, you do the work that you're assigned. And for me, I found over the last year, I'm not interested in building people who just want to be famous to be famous. That holds nothing for me. Who I like working with the most are, they're genuinely business people and entrepreneurs because they're willing to put in the work. If you have a business and you're a real entrepreneur, you know that you put in the work to build that. And for me to be able to help people optimize their process and really strategize their brand in order to make that machine happen for them, that just feels good to me. That's just my sweet spot. Sure. Yeah. Um, my friend Bruce Turkel says, um, uh, a, a good brand makes you feel good. Uh, a great brand makes people feel good about themselves. Um, and, uh, I, I always thought about that um, as being true because, um, and it's, I think it really comes back to doing shit that matters too. Right. So I, I look at, um, and I think as entrepreneurs, we constantly run that tape um, or at least if you're conscious about it, you're running that tape of like, like, am I, am I really doing shit that matters? Like for a while I struggled yeah. with, with the work that we're do here for our agency class. Cause we just do buzz videos for Facebook and for, and for, and for YouTube. And sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I really like these because I found a streamlined way to be able to shoot and produce everything on iPads and iPhones and yay. But at the same time, I'm like, ah, I'm tied to every shoot, and like, et cetera. But then I took a step back and I started to hear testimonials from clients that say, I went from going, I, I, I'm not going to be good on camera to let's go when we shoot the next series. And, and, and someone had said, Sebastian makes you a believer in yourself pertaining to what you can do, pertaining to telling your story and, and creating content. And, I tell you, Brittany, it clicked almost immediately that I thought, that's it. I'm in a, yes, it is a service business, but I'm almost also in service with the business because it's allowing the small guys to kind of catch up with the big guys. So yeah, doing shit that matters, I think is, 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 is absolutely vital. So, so brings you to present day today. Um, you're, you're working with, um, you've, you've done some work with, um, Marie Forleo. Marie's a big fan of the show here. Big fan of hers as well. You did some after, after your Vayner days, right? Yes. After Vayner. So it was funny because I was working with Bonin at Vayner. And then for people who don't know, Bonner, Bonin was a former uh, advertising executive at Mondelez and PepsiCo. And now is, it's been, has his own like investment company and he's been on the speaking circuit and he's doing a bunch of other things. But he was my client at Vayner. And when he knew I was leaving, he was like, I don't, I don't want to lose you. Come, you know, come work for me on my side. So I was working on his brand and I was working on there was another, uh, there's another client, Nikeo Rico, who was under the Sundial Brands uh, umbrella. And she was also ended up being a Vayner Talent client. So I was working with two Vayner Talent clients on the brand side, approving Vayner's work. So working on that end. So it was interesting to see how it works on that side, but also a different shift in dynamic. So that was cool. And then, yes, I started working for Marie Forleo that summer. I was working with her. Um, I was taking on you know, I was starting to take on the clients that I thought I wanted to be taking on. And then just, just like anything else, your business evolves. It's like, okay, yeah. what else can this be? How can I help more people? How can I streamline this process? What don't I like about this? Because my goal was never, yes, I could have left Vayner Talent and just started a Vayner Talent somewhere else. There's enough agencies in LA who want to know that model, who want to be, who are, who want someone who has that experience to build it out. But that wasn't interesting to me. Yeah, that right. wasn't the, the dream wasn't to leave an agency and just start my own agency. And so after working with other people, I was like, okay, what do I really want to be doing? And so now I'm still consulting, but I've kind of moved off. Like you said, you've, you, you're producing people, you're behind the scenes, you're pulling things out of them. There's a cap on the amount of time that I have to be able to do that. So I kind of like, I love Q and a, I love helping people at scale. So for me, the idea of only working with two clients or only three clients because that's all the time I have and I'm traveling with them. That just wasn't appealing to me anymore. Yeah. So 
recently I've been building out digital courses to try to kind of just scale my knowledge that way if you can't afford me and that doesn't that doesn't make sense I can actually help people grow their businesses who couldn't afford a Vayner talent who can't afford you know 30 grand a month or 15 grand a month on their personal brand sure. so that's been just I guess it's my passion project but it's also my my job now yeah yeah what what kind of projects are you working on right now so I've been, I think we were talking about this last week. I've been super hot on LinkedIn. I yeah. think LinkedIn, there's a huge white space within the last year. Yes, everybody has their resume. Everybody put their resume on there when LinkedIn was created however many years ago, like almost a decade ago. And right now they've been embracing content creation. They have super favorable algorithms. I've had a lot of inbound come from LinkedIn. And it's just like anything else. I say I'm platform agnostic because I can build brand on any platform because it's usually the same. It's the same formula everywhere. Uh, and we can go into that. But I'm building out a course right now that hopefully will be live in the next couple of weeks on building your influence on LinkedIn. And then what? I have two other projects I'm working on. One is a course on, on basically making a month's worth of content in a day. Like I was saying earlier, what I can do, if, you, if I'm working with somebody and I, I like know you and your business and we sit down and we have a conversation, I could literally schedule like two to four hours with you to film and I could make a month's worth of content from that. So I want to, that's what the Vayner talent model essentially was, was taking high net worth individuals and just making a shit ton of content from the little amount of time that they have. But if you're in the startup scene, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're just anybody who really is trying to go to work and you know, you need to build a personal brand because that's the way people, people know of you today. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to give those tools to them to actually walk them through that process of how to think about their personal brand, how to actually take those pieces of content, distribute it like what to actually do. So that's, that's kind of part two after this LinkedIn thing. And then the other project I've been working on is because I am a lawyer, I realize that it is not an obvious thing about when you're starting your own business to hire a lawyer, how to hire a lawyer, uh, tax issues, the finance people, just kind of the basics of business that I learned. Even though I have a background in it, I fucked up a lot during the last year. And so I've been working with my attorney who works with a lot of influencers and entrepreneurs to kind of set up a, like a reasonable, kind of like almost like a small business course. That's like, this is what you need. If you're a freelance photographer or you want to be the next D rock or you want to go I follow that guy on Instagram. Is it like San Diego something? Is there a He's Nico Becerra? So I don't know if he goes by the new age lawyer. We're kind of That's working it. on his branding now, okay. but he is so smart. And but this, but um, he, his bio says something like social media attorney, something like that. Yeah, I need, I knew I needed a lawyer. And even as a lawyer, it's intimidating for people to hire a lawyer and it really is necessary, especially if you're in anything client services based or not like just in terms of having the right contracts, not just going to legal zoom and just assuming that everything's fine because you don't know until there's a problem. You just need to be prepared and do it the right way. Absolutely. So those are, those are kind of my, those are my passion projects, but they all revolve around helping people build out their businesses and do the thing that they're best at and that they love. Um, I'm taking notes as I did this. I learned that from my friend, Michelle Villalobos. Um, she says it all the time on her. Um, that's a great connection for you, by the way. I need to connect you with her. Um, uh, she helps people build out their brands and become a superstar. And that's her superstar branding is like her whole deal. And um, she launched her podcast last year. And she's been interviewing some pretty high profile individuals doing some really cool stuff. But um, at the end of every episode, she's like, holy cow, I took three pages of notes. And I thought, that's a great idea. Like it, like the goal of, and you know, you've got a podcast. I want people on my show that are smarter than me, know more than me, have a bigger following than me because we learn from each other. There's something we're going to, you know, we were able to take from that, but I learned that from here. So, um, from her rather, um, so you said something a couple of minutes ago. Um, and then you said something last week when we were on the phone too. uh, personal branding formula. And I'll follow that up with what you had said when we were on the phone last week. And you just said, Sebastian, I just get it when it comes to branding and content. I don't care what the brand is or what the business does. I can sit down and execute a content strategy regardless because I understand the formula. Uh, what's the formula? So the formula is something that I call the three C's and kind of like you were saying before, it's about them. It's about you, but it's about them. So the first C is clarity. 
you need to kind of do that inner work. And this is where the self-awareness stuff comes in, but you need to know who you are, what you're about, and also who you want to talk to. Audience, and I know it's so trite to be saying it, but the audience is the most important thing. If you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. So I'd say it's internal and external clarity. And this is kind of what I'd go into super depth in in the course is how to achieve that. But the internal clarity is that work, knowing the answers to those questions. The external clarity is making sure that your social channels and your blog and your bios all match that internal work. Because it's one thing to know what you're about, but it's another to make sure that that's actually external facing. Because I'm sure people see this on Instagram all the time. You go to someone's bio and they're like, oh, I'm a Libra dog mom, you know, interested in travel, fitness, whatever. And then they're like, oh yeah, but I work in finance. And it's like, okay, well, your content's all around finance. Like, that's just confusing. So it's getting clear. So people don't have, people don't have fucking time. You don't have time. I need to know right away what the deal is. Sure. So that clarity. Then it comes down to, cons- the next C is consistent content. You need to be putting out consistent content. Does that mean 20 times a day? No, not necessarily. You can do consistent content just being, even if it's like a weekly podcast, but you, people just need to know you're there and what you're about. It needs to be consistent, that you're going to show up, that you're not just going to post, you know, five days a week for two weeks, and then you disappear off the face of the earth. And that, you know, the content would be related to the clarity piece, should be related to what you do. And then the last piece is the community piece, which is again, tying back to the audience. That's actually the genuine engagement. That's, that's building that, those people who, you know, that community you want to have. Because ultimately those super fans and those people are what's going to make your business or your brand. Right. And those pieces all tie into each other. And not only that, if there's a problem with, you know, if somebody comes to me and they have a problem with their growth or whatever it is, it is always in one of those things. There is nothing outside of those three things. Got it. Clarity, consistent content and community. Love it. Yep. Love it. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, So, what do you want to talk about now? Well, I, you mentioned I have the podcast. Um, oh, yes. So no. I have a podcast it's called Beyond Influential. Today, my, well, we're on a Wednesday. So they go live every Wednesday. I'm cool. episode 40 today. I've been doing it. Me too. Said, really? Yeah. And I've been doing it for, for like five years. So congrats. <laughs> Thank you. So basically knowing you got to eat your own dog food. The worst thing is, is to hire somebody who does not do what they're recommending. I completely do not buy that. So for me, I was like, okay, well, if I'm doing this and I'm telling all my clients to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking do this too. Yeah. So yeah. every week for the last 40 weeks, I've been putting this out and I've been super consistent about it. It's so basically I've been obsessed with influence and how to grow influence and that just makes sense for me. Yep. And I actually wanted to start the podcast when I was in, uh, when I was still at Vayner, but I realized that there is, I didn't want to start a podcast and have people say that I'm just talking about things that Gary, like I didn't want my things to reflect Vayner necessarily. Right. Right. I wanted to be my own person and, sure. and just be completely independent in terms of thought. So I waited until, uh, until I was completely done. And it's been amazing. And like you said, with with the podcast, I want to talk to people who are influential. And my whole thing is that um, every industry has influencers. I call them industry influencers. That just makes sense. Like if you're in the accounting world, you're in the legal world, I don't care what world you're in. There are people who are influencers and influential and whether they're influential online or not, they're just people that you look to as the experts and the authorities. It's never been easier, and this is unfortunate for people who are actually really good at whatever, whatever they do, to move up that, that rank and that, you know, to move up in their industry and kind of get there by positioning themselves properly online. You have no idea how many people come to me who are like, oh, I've had so much experience in this world. I'm scared to put out content, but this person who like just showed up yesterday in this industry is getting these speaking gigs. And it's like, yeah, like this is how it works. You can get there too. And if you actually have the experience and the know-how of your industry, we can make content around it. So it's just a really cool time. So I've been yeah, learning from all my guests. It, it is an exciting time to be alive. Um, um, Gary talks about that a lot. He always has for 10 years. <laughs> for 10 years, it's been this is the most exciting time to be alive. And it just <laughs> becomes more and more exciting. And he's also consistently said that you know, this is just the beginning. 
Like it is, is still and like we're still in its infancy. And he's such a, and he's a hyper optimist. I'm listen, like compared to Gary, I'm wouldn't say I'm negative, but I'm, I'm a realist. Like I, there's a reason I went to law school. I'm very logical. I'm not, you know, I'm not showering myself in crystals. Like I'm not going to sell you some kind of crap in that way, but it's true. I actually did. And it's amazing. I did a random photo shoot and this is just like the power of Instagram for a hotel on Monday. And that's completely separate kind of from, you know, the brand business that I'm building, but they found me from Instagram. So much of my business now has been from people reaching out to me on LinkedIn. And I'm, the beauty is I'm not even outbounding. I'm not like, Hey, I want, it's not the hard sell. I'm just putting out content related to what's going on in the, in the brand world day to day. Like just things that I think are interesting and other people think that shit's interesting. The worst also is when I get people who come to me and they're like, Oh, but my, my industry is boring. It's like you're in your industry. There are people that want to be in your position that want to be in your industry. Your shit is not boring. Right. You need to right. get out of that. This is the best time. And if you want to switch industries, if you're not happy, Gary's right. This, my job didn't even exist. You know, when I was in, in college. This wasn't even a choice. This wasn't an option. Facebook yeah. started when I was in college. And right. now I'm doing something that, that I love. I transitioned. I was able to transition careers. I didn't need to go to the business school everybody said I needed to go to. I didn't need to do any of that. You, you went to need, business school, just not, a, it, not yeah. at a university. <laughs> I know that if I, had I gone to business school, I would have wasted more time than gone to go work at a company like a Pepsi, been in brand management, been miserable, tried to figure it out it would have taken me the completely wrong way. And you don't need to do any of that shit anymore. So why would you? You don't, you can, you can eliminate a lot of that. The only thing that you can't replace is the experience that you get while working underneath individuals Correct. like Gary. And I look back on, 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 my, um, and on my journey prior to being an entrepreneur. And I became an entrepreneur young, you know, I think 24, 25 years old is, is pretty young to become an entrepreneur, especially yeah. back then. I want to say back then, but, um, I look at the individual, but it, that still continues. And if you, if you position yourself correctly with the projects and the clients that you're working with, you're in turn, just like you said, the people that are on your podcast show, you're learning from these individuals um, too. Uh, when you're, 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 they're, 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 we all have our different smarts, right? You've got the yeah. branding content side down. They're clueless on that, but they may have their, what they've mastered with their business down. And that's what we're able to reciprocate back to each other and really learn from each other, you know? Yeah, you really need to learn from from the people. And you're right. Like I did, I knew when those jobs weren't for me, but each of those jobs I was taking something from. All of the people I worked for and I was assisting and what I was doing, those people got to those positions for a reason. They all had great, just great knowledge. So I know that's kind of a thing now for people who are 19 years old to be like, I'm an entrepreneur and just be putting out content and business content. And from a lot of that stuff, it's like, fuck you. Like you don't, you don't actually know anything about business. And I really don't like that trend, but that's another reason why I'm so passionate about people who are actually entrepreneurs and actually building something, getting yeah. their message out there. Because what's so unique, they're not gonna all be like Gary. I could work with thousands of entrepreneurs. You're all gonna have different experience. You're all gonna have different areas. You're all gonna have different expertise. You don't need to all be yelling at the camera or cursing or whatever it is. It doesn't need to be you know, just the content that's out there. So I think people need to think about if you are an entrepreneur that you don't need to be putting out, you know, the hustle, grind, work shit that everybody else is putting out. Yeah, stop signing your fucking memes, okay? You're not Gary. <laughs> Jamie, Christmas. That's like the worst thing. I mean, like, people send them to me because they know Gary and I are friends. So it's like, what, do you want me to tell the guy to stop doing it? Like, I don't, I mean, yeah, Gary coined it and, it's, and his content's dope, but anybody else does it, it's whack a doodle. I got called a Gary V wannabe one time after a talk back in 2015, I think it was. And Gary gave a talk at that conference was for EO. <laughs> It was in Philadelphia oh. for EO, for, the, for, uh, for Nerve. And he gave the opening keynote and I gave, a, uh, I gave the following breakout session on social media. And at that point in time, I was, you know, two, three years into the game. I was, you know, all out Gary V nuts up, short of cussing people out on stage, which he doesn't really do, but uh, uniquely, for, you know, for delivering um, the F-bomb, which, which everyone kind of, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant. This day and age, I, st 
I kind of do, but at the same time, you know, you're not Gary. You know, what I mean, <laughs> like he can get away with a lot more. Unfortunately, just the way it is. You can call it fair, you can call it favoritism, whatever it is. But I think you know, you have a little bit more clout and credibility. You can, in fact, even in smaller circles, like I'm giving like chamber talks or like my networking group or whatever. I thought, what if somebody sees a video where I'm like, oh fuck, and they're like. He's a great speaker, but I don't know if I want to hire him because you don't have the chops. So I th I'm conscious about that, you know, but, um, it's funny you're um, talking about that. Cause my, my dad, so my, I don't know why my dad was listening to my podcast, but my parents don't really listen to my podcast, but my dad was listening to one that I did a few weeks ago about, uh, LeBron moving to the Lakers and what you could learn from top athletes, personal brands. And I do naturally swear. I swore before Gary, I've, that's <laughs> my demeanor. Sure. And I think that's, because that's authentic to me, the people who would be attracted to that are the ones that I would want anyway, because, and I think this is the way Gary operates too. And I know it, he can't, even if he's hired for something where they're like, please don't curse. And he tries not to curse. That's, it's just, he just can't not be himself. Yeah. So it's, it's knowing when that comes from a place that it's, it's real and being able to put aside that the content's actually valuable. Sure. I mean, yeah, it depends. Like if you want to be speaking at the Chamber of Commerce and you're going to be speaking to people who are, you know, 50 plus and might not be as cool with it, then you might have to adjust your shtick. But for me, I, I know there's, it's very hard for me not to do it. So he, talk, he talks about it publicly a lot too, you know, about, you know, being asked to not, you know, to refrain from, and I, I get it. You're being centered. And I've noticed some talks that he actually has been able to pull it off. Um, and I just learned from that, you know, et cetera. I always think, you know, if my mom sees the dog, which she watches all of them, um, she's the first phone call. You know, you don't need to be used. You need to, what's her famous line? You need to find a new word. Yeah. <laughs> and my daughter's like, can't you just use pickles? You know, <laughs> I'm like, it's not. I already the same. swore like 20 times on this podcast. So that's, I hope well, that's what podcasts are for. You know, you're, you're, uh, you know, Joe Rogan <laughs> takes pride in the F bomb on his podcast. Um, so uh, what else did I want to talk about? I think the personal branding stuff, your podcast stuff, the Beyond the, Beyond the, Beyond the Hustle, is that the name of it? No, what is it? Beyond, beyond Influential. Beyond Influential. Correct. Listeners, Beyond in, in, Influential, uh, wherever you consume uh, podcasts, you probably iTunes, unless you're some Android weirdo, then you could probably <laughs> find it there too. But it's there uh, too. Yes. Of course, we want to meet our audience wherever they show. It was funny. I went live right before. I had a few minutes to kill and I was like, and I've been, and oh, that we'll wrap up with, with this is what I want to talk about. So you said, you know, I started my podcast because I can't be telling people to go start a podcast or creating content. I'm not doing anything, right? So you got to be a product of the product, right? To sell the product. Like that's just border, that's just bottom line sales 101. And um, I've always thought that. And that's why I'm doing this right now. And I continue the passion project and I restarted my podcast for the third time. But as of late, I've been doing a couple, couple things. The first thing is um, taking the stage with zero planning and zero slides. I believe a true pro can get on stage and give a structured, detailed talk that makes an emotional connection and still delivers uh, value where people are like, that was awesome. Um, and then I've been just hitting, like my buddy Brian Fanzo says, just press the damn button. I've literally just been going live and going, hey guys, what's happening? Um, I actually don't know what I want to discuss, uh, but some things are happening today. I've, this is what happened this morning based on, what, uh, I got an email, an article, and I just kind of let it flow for the first couple minutes and it turns into something. Um, I, I said, well, I've got 10 minutes to kill before I've got the interview with Brittany. What, what can I talk about here? And I said, uh, I always think about the case study in, uh, Gary's second book, The Thank You Economy of AJ Bombers and how they treat their customers and how they allowed them to create the menu and how they allowed to give them feedback and pricing and hours of operation and the peanuts and all that. So I busted out Thank You Economy from my bookshelf. And sure enough, it was an actual entire chapter. I bit off a little more than I could chew. I'm like, it's story time with Sebi. So I, I, so I didn't do that, but I opened it up and I had to laugh because that was the first time I met Gary and it was here in Miami and he signed it. Seabass, please more than 10. So at the beginning of the interview, I'm all hyped. This is like pre bow tie days. I got like the Poindexter glasses on. And I'm like, this is a very special episode 10 of Social Buzz TV. And I'm like all fired up. He's like, wait, 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 wait. Did you just say 10 episodes? Come on, dude. And he had just wrapped like a thousand of Wine Library TV, etc. So, um, 
I opened that up, started telling the story of AJ Bombers. I think it's really cool. And I, I was able to get a, I don't know, six or seven minute um, little piece of content out because if people are, if I'm asking people to buy videos for their business to tell their story or to, to start a podcast, I've got to have a podcast. I've got to be creating that content and it yields, like you said, a lot of it's inbound and you're in, in, in business. If you're entrepreneurs that are listening to this or watching this or whatever you're doing, maybe watching it and listening, obviously, um, you're, 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 you're able to, to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you're able to, to increase your credibility by authentically, that's an overused word in this industry, but authentically telling your story in a very transparent way. Like now I can talk about not having a car and riding my skateboard every day. When I first started, that shit wasn't cool. And it wasn't something I was going to go talk about. Like, I wasn't going to go live from the bus stop. Live wasn't was available then. But I could go live today from a bus stop and tell that story. So it's funny how that really increases our, our, our credibility, number one. Number two, get the phone ringing. Get the inbound business of saying, hey, I saw that video. The opportunities that have happened, I'm sure it's happened for you too, that have, that have come out of a YouTube video or an Instagram post or you know something just random. I remember... Someone called because they had seen me having lunch with a buddy of mine and he had a book um, and he was part of a local church here that she went to. And she's like, oh yeah, I saw, and my book was sitting on the table at the bakery while we were having lunch and he was like looking the other way. And she's like, I know this is like random, but I'm a friend of, I, I attend Pedro's church and I'm a friend of his and I saw your book with your name clearly on that. I go, that's why I always put the book on the table after I give it to someone on there. But it just, you never know what opportunities are going to show up. But, you know, like Fanzo's constantly preaching these days, press the damn button. Like, it's so simple, but so freaking accurate. And everyone can resonate with that phrase. People go, how, you know, how do I get started with, with content, et cetera? Like, hey, do me a favor, take out your phone. Okay, cool. Pull up video. All right, ready? See that red button right there? Press the damn thing. Okay, right here. Boom, press it. And people go, Oh yeah, but it's still that push. And that's why individuals like us exist because people need that push and they need the ability to yank that story out of them, I think. Yeah, and for people who just to, I mean, you are a hundred percent correct, but just for people who, cause I know video isn't, isn't something that everybody's very comfortable with right away. I'm Not still learning all. to get comfortable with video, but I know I can use my words, which is another reason why I like LinkedIn is because actual, like if you're good at just even typing out thoughts, words can actually go viral there, which is nice. Not that virality is the thing to, to care about, but if you're, you have three thoughts in a week, you, you think three things related to your work for a week, like just turn those into, into copy, read them if you, or think about them before you, you know, talk on your phone if you want. It really doesn't need to be a big deal. The nice thing is content, even though things live online forever, it doesn't, doesn't really, people have a short attention span with it. And the things that you do have to say are valuable and come from, you know, come from a different place than everyone else's. So re people really shouldn't be afraid to do it. No, not at all. And I think it's becoming more of the norm. And, you know, there's a lot of, it was an old joke, or not an old joke, a newer joke rather of like the top three. I'm in this networking group weekly called BNI and it's one category per chapter. So you got one marketing guy, you got one SEO guy, you got a doctor, you got a chiropractor, attorney, et cetera. Um, and we're always talking about growing our chapter and here's the categories that we're looking for. Um, and then, uh, so he started off with a joke saying, you know, the, the realtor went in to get his hair cut and the barber said, hey, you know, what do you do? And the guy's like, I'm a realtor. And again, the barber goes, me too. But the top three, top three, the top three industries or jobs out there right now are realtor, social media manager, and uh, personal trainer. So um, uh, <laughs> I laugh about that a lot, you know, because it's, it really is difficult to, to um, separate yourself from the crowd. But I think your experience and your content allow you to separate yourself from the crowd. And I, 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 you know, you live that, I live that on a daily basis. Um, okay, we're gonna close things out with this. I, I have a strong feeling that over the past 10 years, there's been a wave of influences, right? The Gary's and the Grant Cardone's and the, uh, you know, the, the Lewis Howells and the people that have really come up and done some really, really cool shit and crushed it, right? I believe there's a new phase of, of, of talent and in, in real, true influencers coming up 
within that there's like a new wave of it right and yeah. the existing wave of the Gary's and the Lewis Howes and those guys are there to support the next generation and then where everybody's an influencer and I, I do this too all those people start to start to kind of wean themselves out if you will because this new generation is coming up and that's the guys like you know Brian Fanzo and yourself and 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 me I really feel that we're part of that so I think that um We've like been basic training, influencer basic training. So like for the past like, you know, X amount of years that it's been really figuring this whole landscape out. But it feels fun when a brand actually says, you know, we don't know what we're doing, but we want to know and you know what you're doing. So help us out. But um, yeah, would you agree with that? As far as I, mean, the, I completely agree with that. And, you know, people forget about this, but Gary's been making content since minimum 2006. You know, Lewis also, before he was doing all the things he's doing now, and I know he met Gary a long time ago, he'd been making content forever. He was actually like the LinkedIn guy, God knows how many years ago. Yeah. All of you people, this is a journey. And the people who actually have put in true work and, like I said, know who they are, they're staying consistent, have built this community, those are the people who are going to do it. Like, that's just, that's just the end of the story. Like, For you sure. actually need that experience. Everybody who's faking right now, that's just not going to last. And Gary talks about playing the long game. It is a long game. Like I know committing to the podcast, if you want to start a podcast, that's great. But I know that that's like a three year minimum commitment of being consistent to something. Like you have to go in knowing that this is, this, this is why I don't work with people who just want to be famous. Being right. famous, it comes from putting in a shit ton of work and having talent in that area. Right. You don't get to be famous to be famous. So I see that, that the, the cream rises to the top. There's no, there's no way around that. It really, it really, really does. All right. So we'll end things with, and I, and I, I borrowed this from a friend of mine's show. Um, I thought it was very unique. Um, so uh, let's say that you and I cut across each other's path again at another event or et cetera. And um, uh, your crew's there. We've met some mutual friends and we're at the hotel bar because we've been out at, uh, we've been out for that VIP party, but after the night, a quick nightcap. Um, and instead of a, just being one nightcap, I've convinced the whole crew and yourself that we're going to go sing karaoke. But you and I are going to sing a d duet specifically. So what song would we sing? Which duet? It needs to be a spe it needs specifically to be a duet? Or well, yeah, can it be? Like, um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I'm talking, you know, rivers in the stream, you know, a little. Because little, uh. my best stuff is, is rap. So my favorite was always the Beastie Boys. And there were three of them. So I feel oh, like we could switch we could, off. We could totally recruit. Yeah, whether it's. I don't, I really do like, um, which would be, which one would it be? Maybe I'd go with, Sabotage is usually a pretty good karaoke song. Fight for Your Right is, is good, but I feel like that's almost too trite. I'd want to go with something that actually had. Brass Monkey? Had more. Brass Monkey is great. Yeah. I would do any of those. Anything Beastie Boys related, I will do with you. All right. Well, it's public now. It's on YouTube. It's on, yep. it's on the Facebooks <laughs> now, so. Whenever I have an opportunity to do karaoke with Brittany Hoffman, the Beastie Boys is what's going down. So I thought you were going to ask me what drink I would get. I was like, oh, bourbon. <laughs> yes. Hey, there you go. My kind of girl. So I think we did have a bourbon on that rooftop uh, place. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we did. I at that one evening there. So with Bonin around, for sure. Got some drinks going down. So very, very cool. Uh, well, this has been, this has been awesome. I've, I've learned a ton and it's been great to further connect with you. And I, you know, we got a few things that we chatted about that uh, we may be able to work on um, too, and just be fun to, to see what, what crossover um, you know, starts to reveal itself, but you keep rocking. It's been fun to, uh, to, to follow you and then jump out of the bushes at the Grand Hyatt and introduce <laughs> myself and, um, and, uh, and, and continue to, to, to support each other's journey. It's funny how it all works, isn't it? It all sort of over an email. You were trying to send me a damn book, you know? So, I mean, that's the world. The world is super small right now. So I know I'll be seeing you again. Yes. And, yeah, and if tiny. your audience has any questions when it comes to branding, please hit me up. I'm, you know, BrittanyCrystal.com, but I'm Brittany Crystal at all of my handles. Like, you'll, you'll find me. And that's K R Y S T L E, correct? Correct. And B R I now Brittany people spell different ways. B R I T T A N Y. Well, I was like, which is the way you spell Brittany? Right? That's how I think it's the way you spell Brittany, but you know. <laughs> well, 
podcast listeners and YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, you look down in the description, all of Brittany's links are there. You can follow her on Instagram and Twitter. And 10 years ago, if you said you were following me, I'd call the police. But this day and age, it's so <laughs> completely, so completely relevant. You'll be able to get a link to her podcast. Make sure you subscribe to her. She's getting some awesome guests on there um, that, uh, like, like, like I said, that are smarter than us, that know more than us, that we can learn from. So, which by default um, makes for awesome, awesome content. Well, you keep rock, rocking and rolling out there in, uh, in Southern California. California, and next time I'm out there, I will for sure. We're gonna get some fish tacos, dude, and some bourbon. <laughs> and some bourbon. That's a great mix. You know, my favorite things to do. I don't know if they still do it on Thursday nights at um, at the Shamrock. Is that the name of it? Shamrock Irish Where's Pub. That? It's it's off right off uh, right off uh, Main Street. Uh, it's like the first block off Main Street. There's oh a, yes, that is it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Is it, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a, like a legit club or something. No, the shamrock. It's, I know exactly. It's like a legit about. Irish bar. You walk in, you're like, this is a pub like type deal. Anyway, they did on, on Saturday night, they have a fiddle player that does like, I, what's it called music. And then, um, what was it? I think that was the night. Yeah. Saturday night, Saturday night, they have like Irish, like fiddle. I don't know what it is, but it used to be one of my favorite things to do down there in crazy downtown Huntington beach. I'm going to have to go. I usually try to avoid the crazy downtown, but if you're out here, I'll go. And, com and there's a comedy night some nights too at that same Irish. That was the only place I would go there in hurricanes, but you know, that, that tap beer, you wake up the next day and you're like, why, why did I do they got, You know, they got, Fred's is still there. Fred's Mexican. Game. They got those big yes. sco like schooners, dude. They're like, dude, let's go get a schooner, you know, <laughs> meathead center out there. I never saw so many jerseys and tattoos and hats on backwards than I did in Huntington beach, California. So <laughs> That look didn't work for me, Brittany. I don't know if you didn't see me in a wife beater and a hat backwards with a bunch of tattoos, but. No, oh, with a raised, raised truck. Oh, wow. Yeah. Could you imagine? No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. All right, Brittany, I will, uh, I'll talk with you soon. Thanks again for your time today. Uh, and this was Thank awesome. You.